All right. Well, um, I'm Dr. Casey McCarthy, the beef cow calf specialist based in Lincoln. Uh, it's great to be back uh, for a second year presenting here at the cow calf college. Um, love getting out and about on my days that I'm not teaching. So um, I teach our cow calf class in the, the spring semester for seniors um, interested in animal science um, and then also teach a class in the fall. So I uh, love being able to get out and about. And today we're going to start thinking about how we can prepare our bull battery for the breeding season. I know we're just starting calving. But breeding season is not very far away and I want to just get us thinking about uh, some, some things and how we manage uh, our bulls uh, right now and then moving into breeding season. So um, when we think about what, um, what we need to be considering with our, our bulls and management, um, I really wanna dive into the importance of our bulls, thinking about nutrition and those important time points, um, and, and, and diving in and thinking about if we're purchasing bulls, how they were raised, if we have bulls or older bulls or younger bulls, how are we going to manage them uh, ultimately uh, to help make sure that they're su successful breeders uh, moving into breeding season. And uh, we're gonna dive into some components of uh, BSE, so breeding soundness exam, um, and, and really just kind of talk about what we can do to make sure that they're ready for that se next season. So um, this is some newer data from NOMS. So NOMS is the National Animal um, Health and Monitoring System. And so they compile data from across the country from uh, producers uh, with one to two cows all the way up to thousands and thousands of cows. Um, and ultimately what this data really illustrates is the importance and how highly utilized our bulls are um, in our breeding seasons across the U.S. And so uh, most recently, uh, operations that are only exposing bull, uh, bulls to their cows in red here is about 93%. Um, heifers, uh, this number actually decreased a little bit from the last uh, data set that they collected where we're seeing uh, utilization of AI and bull exposure actually increasing in our, our heifers. Uh, and a lot of that um, utilizing lower birth weight semen, um, bulls uh, with AI, and then turning bulls out on those females as well after AI. Um, but the big thing I want you guys to know and think about is our bulls are really important and, and how are we going to manage them to make sure that our our utilization matches those preg rates and expectations. So we're going to dive into how we manage these bulls during critical time points. Um, some of these may not uh, really matter to you in a sense because we we have bulls on our operation now and we're, we're not developing bulls. But for those that are developing bulls or asking questions, um, what are things that we need to be thinking about? And so pre-weaning is that, that stage where these, these bulls are still on mom, they're, they're out in the pasture and they are developing sperm that ultimately at the end of the day is what's gonna be produced when they're mature and out, um, out in your breeding pasture. So um, from four to 20 weeks of age, there is rapid proliferation of Sertoli cells. Tertulli cells are ultimately what's going to lead to sperm. And so this rapid production, they're basically generating all the sperm that they're ever going to produce early on during this stage. And so um, after this stage, that all of that production stops. And so how those, those calves are managed and, and making sure that we're ultimately supporting them nutritionally to make sure we're meeting those requirements uh, is really important. And so uh, when we think about poor pre-weaning nutrition, now this may or may not be an issue, but when we, we think about poor nutrition during this time frame, we start to see decreases in testicle size, decreases in sperm production, and then ultimately uh, increasing that age at puberty. 
And so when we think about poor nutrition, those bulls aren't getting all the requirements, we're delaying that onset of puberty. And so what can we do maybe to manage some of that? Um, one example that uh, is typically recommended if we think about trying to increase that nutritional plane for our calves is supplying a creek feed. If we're dealing with a low quality forage, there's opportunities to creep feed. However, when we think about our heifers and if we're providing too much of that energy source um, and depositing too much fat, uh, we start seeing issues in heifers, especially in terms of fatty udders um, and, and other um, issues um, if, we, if we start kind of pushing those females too young, too fast. Uh, when we think about um, poor quality forage or poor quality or forage av availability in general, um, this is in timeframes when we're just not meeting energy and protein needs. And so can we think about providing the supplement um, or increasing that energy intake uh, for those calves? Um, when we also think about bulls from cows versus bulls from heifers, um, generally, we're encouraging that selection from a cow basis. We, we've seen some data um, that ultimately those bulls from cows, uh, we're, we're seeing a little better production and sperm production out of those calves. Um, now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, if we're doing embryo transfer, we're thinking about recipients, uh, that maternal environment is also something that we need to be considering uh, matching that calf production in utero, basically, um, with what your expectations are. So a lot of different things that we can consider or that could ultimately impact uh, some of that pre-weaning uh, nutrition. Uh, this is some data when we think about post-weaning and even into our mature bulls, um, that fat accumulation around the testes. So if we're getting these bulls really fat, um, you know, they're up to four pounds a day or something for, for gains. And we're really trying to push them uh, for all that they are, uh, you know, to get ready for bull sale. Um, we can start seeing detriment to that production. And so when you think about the testes and, and how they function, uh, the, the further those testes are down, basically they're trying to, to move away from that body heat to help regulate because those testes need to be about four degrees cooler than body temperature. And so we can have impacts uh, on how, how much energy dense feed uh, we're, we're feeding to these guys in terms of increasing sperm growth um, and ultimately impacting some of those human characteristics. So there's a lot of different strategies. I'm not gonna dive much in anymore into some of our weaning, post weaning, uh, management of our, our bulls, but I really want us to be thinking about what are our next steps when we think about moving into our breeding season. Now we, we've got our bulls at home. Uh, we maybe we just went out to a, some bull sales or we're planning to, to go to some bull sales here pretty soon. Uh, how can we manage these bulls when we get them back to our place and get ready to, to turn out uh, here later in the spring and early summer? So we know that the workload in our bulls and the expectations of our bulls is high, but extremely variable. Now, uh, some research out of North Dakota, they were um, interviewing, that's where interviewing a lot of their producers um, identified a wide range of variability among these bulls. Uh, four to 80 females per bull in terms of that range and variability of what bulls were covering. So we know that we're expecting them to cover a lot of females. That can vary, right? And some of that's libido. Some of that is um, just stocking rates in general with our, our bull to female ratio. Um, but we know that if those bulls are working and working hard, uh, they're gonna lose weight. And so how do we manage some of that weight loss uh, before and after the breeding season uh, to make sure that they're ready for that next breeding season? And so um, ultimately the, the recommendations that we, we like to, to think about are how can we make sure that those bulls are regaining some of that weight loss, um, but not overdoing it, right? Um, you know, 
there's there's opportunities here uh, to get bulls too fat or keep them too skinny. So what is that, um, you know, that happy medium? So when I think about requirements for our bulls and making sure that we're meeting those uh, during different stages, uh, that a lot is going to depend on age and weight of those bulls. And so the first example that I like to think about are our yearling bulls, maybe they're 12 to 1400 pounds. Uh, we're, we're getting them home and uh, we're still targeting about 2% of that body weight in terms of, of dry matter intake. And so these bulls are still gaining anywhere from a pound and a half to two pounds a day. Um, and, and we're making sure that we're targeting anywhere from seven to 9% crude protein in that forage um, or feed. Um, and, and reaching about that 55 to 65% TD in forage. And those can usually help us meet those targets for those uh, expected gains. Now, that's a whole different beast when we compare it to maybe our mature 2000 pound bull. Uh, when we think about these guys, we want to keep them fat and happy, right? And maintain that body weight. They're at uh, a mature body weight, um, if not maybe even a little more. And so in terms of gain, we, we just want them to maintain. And so these guys can really get a, away with an all forage diet and, and meeting those requirements. Um, but still keeping in mind that it's gonna be a little lower in terms of crude protein and TDN, um, but they're still at about 30 pounds of dry matter intake uh, to meet those requirements. So a lot of variability in how we manage them and especially when and when they weigh what they do and what our um, anticipated gains are for those bulls. And if, especially when we think about our yearling bulls and how we're managing them before and after breeding season. And so I, I really like to, to illustrate where, you know, we're uh, maybe buying or developing our yearling bulls. Um, and this is a April turnout um, suggestion, su uh, example uh, for breeding season, but we've got 1200 pound yearling Bull, and uh, he's turned out for 90 days. Um, into the breeding season, say early July, uh, we're really trying to target, um, you know, those early springborn calves. Um, but he had lost, you know, two to 300 pounds. Um, he, he was really trying to work and figure things out. Um, but we thought roughly 200 or so days to help him get back on track. Um, but we also need to keep in mind, these guys are still growing. They're not at their mature body weight yet. And so what can we do to make sure that they're putting that, that weight back on? And so um, if we, we send them out to a, a pasture, um, we're, we're targeting that summer grazing. Um, now we need to then think about, okay, we're moving into winter. That low quality forage is starting to hit us in July, August, September. Um, so what do we have in terms of resources to help meet energy requirements to put weight back on? And so that cycle then starts all over again, but we've gained about 600 pounds between then the breeding and that next breeding season. And so we, we have time to be able to put that weight back on, but understanding what resources we have available in terms of what your forage quality and quantity is what supplements you have available, all play into how we can manage these guys uh, during the breeding season and after. So typically when we're looking at our bulls and thinking about how we're managing them, uh, body condition score is usually gonna target that five to six. Um, that's usually that moderate condition, uh, same similar target for our cows. Um, if, you know, if we're challenging those females a little bit, uh, we may see more of that four and a half to five body condition score. Um, but keep in mind that these bulls are working and we're expecting them to be, to be athletes during that breeding season. So are they, are they in shape? Do they have enough fat covered to help them uh, burn that energy through the breeding season? Now, when we think about moving into those winter temps, uh, I do like to really keep us thinking about how low temps and wind ultimately are going to increase our requirements, typically 25 to 30% above normal maintenance requirements. So uh, luckily we've 
had a bit of a mild winter, right? Um, but I, I know guys up in North Dakota that are getting blasted with blizzards and snow, um, making sure that we're conscientious about meeting those requirements, depending on what our weather looks like, uh, and making sure that we're increasing that feed uh, to meet those requirements. When we think about pre-breeding, so now we've gone through winter, um, this is really a bullet point that I like to think about when we are purchasing our yearling bulls. They've been on a higher concentrate diet, potentially, depending on where you're getting them from. Um, the, the extension recommendation is generally to, to step those bulls down. Um, we have an opportunity now uh, from a research standpoint, um, working uh, with US Mark and from mentors up at North Dakota, uh, where we're actually looking at how we manage these bulls in terms of gains and losses prior to that breeding season. Um, do we keep them on a higher plane um, and, and move through breeding season? Or is that recommendation that's typically uh, been suggested uh, to make sure that we're keeping up with our gains, uh, but if they're going to go out on grass or go where those cows are at, um, do we have them transitioned uh, to appropriate diet? And so uh, what I like to get us thinking about is backing them down, getting them on that same plane of nutrition. Those bulls are gonna go out on, on grass with cows. Can we get them acclimated uh, before they get turned out? Um, really continue to assess body condition and understand where those bulls are at before breeding, during the breeding season, and then moving into post-breeding and and really identifying what those changes are in terms of uh, overall condition. Um, like I mentioned, there's a ton of variability in terms of what bulls can lose or potentially gain, depending on if they're working or not. Um, and so keeping an eye on that condition can really help you manage those bulls uh, through breeding and or make some changes um, if you've got bulls that are, are overworked um, and, and make those management decisions. So when I like to, to think about, um, especially with the number of breeding seasons, um, so workload is gonna come back and play, play a role in this. So if we're setting our bulls up, um, do we have one or two breeding seasons? Um, the example that I like to use is our, our Sandhills Ranch, uh, Goodman's Sandhills Lab um, out, out west have a March and a May herd. Now those bulls get about a week off and then they go back and start breeding that next group. Um, managing condition and really making sure that those bulls don't have injuries uh, and are allowed some recovery time before they get back out is very important to think about. Now, if we're working with maybe a spring and a fall herd, those bulls are gonna have quite a bit more time to recover. Um, so just keeping an eye on condition um, making sure that if you're identifying injuries, those, those are observed um, so you know how to manage that um, if you do have multiple breeding seasons. When we're thinking about younger bulls, I'll show you some data here in the next few slides, um, but we need to keep in mind those yearling bulls, they're still growing, they're trying to figure out what their job is. And so um, it's some really interesting data um, with number of mounts that I'll show you here in the next few slides. Um, but keep it in mind, they are gonna lose some weight. Um, so how do we manage those after the breeding season? So um, most of the time our younger bulls, you know, we're, we're targeting that pound and a half to two pound a day gain, um, making sure that they're still increasing that growth, increasing that body weight to, to meet that mature body weight. Um, <clears throat> You know, always like to, to recommend a good mineral program. Uh, there's been a number of specific minerals that have been found to impact uh, performance in as well as um, some semen characteristics. Uh, so uh, if that's an option, providing that good mineral um, is also something to consider. Uh, but if you don't provide a mineral, that's all right too. Just know that um, some of these play an important role in fertility as well. So we're gonna dive into some management here. Um, you know, thinking about how we're setting these bulls up. Uh, I'll show you some data on the next slide, um, but our bull to cow ratio can vary. Um, that's gonna vary depending on pasture size, 
um, if we're utilizing uh, any type of estrus synchronization. Uh, so if we're synchronizing our females, uh, we're gonna have a large majority of females uh, ready to breed in a very short time period. And so do we have the workload and the bulls available to make sure that they can cover X number of females? So um, that variation in terms of bull to cow ratio can vary from 10 to 50, um, but pasture size, bull libido, um, and also identifying semen quality um, and characteristics are all important uh, to consider, um, even when we think about bull age as well. So uh, the data is talking about in here, uh, back in the 90s, really looking um, and utilizing some heifers in a non-synced or synchronized uh, study, uh, looking at 1 to 50 or 1 to 25 or 1 to 16. Um, now, these were some younger um, heifers, but more mature bulls. Uh, when we look at the numbers that they had in terms of bull to heifer ratios, you can see uh, based on the ratio, that's going to increase um, the, the number of heifers and bulls there. Um, but what I'd like to point out here is in terms of pregnancy rates, uh, we, we are seeing some increases um, in that, that first cycle uh, of those females. And so depending on that ratio, at the end of the day, uh, what they determined was that 1 to 25 was kind of the best bang for your buck. Um, now that was for this study, um, that doesn't mean that that can be adjusted up or down depending on your operation. Um, but generally we like to recommend around that 25 to make sure that the, that workload for those bulls uh, can get the job done. What I really like to think about though is our age of our bulls. Now uh, this table has one, two, and three plus year old bulls on the top here. Um, and what I really like to point out is where these bulls are at in terms of number of mouths. Our yearling bulls get turned out with cows or heifers um, that are in heat or maybe just coming into heat, right? Depending on um, if any synchronization protocols are being used. Um, but ultimately, when you take a look at the, the table here, um, our yearly bulls were about 207 mounts versus 85.8 in this study. That is a lot. These guys, if you've ever watched yearly bulls out in the pasture, uh, they are all over the place. Heads, feet, legs, backs. They, they're trying to figure out uh, what their job is. And so making sure um, that we, we understand that these yearly bulls are going to need to figure some things out uh, keep that in mind when we think about our stocking rates. Um, the other thing I like to, to point out, especially with younger bulls, is uh, the, the duration of uh, that utilization of bulls. We were working on a study out here at US Mark uh, utilizing yearly bulls with heifers. Um, they've got a 30-day breeding season. Uh, those bulls uh, lost um, about a condition score um, and we also see impacts um, between uh, our bulls that were covering females, and then we actually kept some bulls that weren't covering females, so we gave them basically an extra month um, of not breeding and just, and just eating out on pasture. We're seeing differences in semen characteristics, um, and so that's just year one of data. This is an ongoing study, um, but I, what I really want to highlight is um, how we manage those yearling bulls. So if we have mature bulls and then we're bringing in some yearlings, um, how, how are you managing those bulls to ensure that they're, um, they're still gonna get the job done but not be overworked? And so those bulls are still developing, our, our semen capacity and the, the, that semen quality is still developing as they mature. Um, and so being, being attentive in terms of uh, our utilization of those, those yearling bulls would be really important. Um, at the end of the day, we, we did see increases in pregnancy rates, but um, you know we need, we need to make sure that uh, how we're managing those bulls depending on the age, um, we're allowing them enough time to, to figure out their job. Also figuring out their job really relates back to social dominance as well. And so when we think about 
establishing that pecking order among our, our bull battery, um, allowing them time to figure that out before they actually have to go out and do their job is really important. So if you're introducing new, new bulls to the herd, um, if you're switching pastures, uh, you know, really make sure that you, you have this stuff out of the way um, before you, you turn them out to pasture. Um, you want them to be already have figured out where their pecking order is um, and, and be able to go out and breed females. And so, um, and this is also a really good opportunity if you know that there's a couple bulls that just don't get along uh, in your bull battery, um, that they should not be in the same pasture group for breeding season. So observe, make sure um, you're, you're establishing that early. Um, this is also an opportunity if bulls do get hurt, um, you're, you're identifying that, um, but there are risks, but make sure that you're, you're giving them enough uh, room and space and time uh, to establish that element. Uh, the other component I like uh, to keep in mind is libido. Now, libido is not evaluated in our breeding soundness exams. I'm gonna recap what a BSE is um, here in the next few slides, but I want us to keep in mind that even if our bull is a satisfactory breeder, uh, when you turn him out to pasture, if he isn't interested in going and doing his job, um, we, we may be dealing with some libido issues. Um, and so that isn't captured in that test, in that one-time test. Um, some of that is also influenced by breed and by age, um, but it's not an indicator of fertility. Um, and so making those observations making sure that you're identifying those bulls that um, are breeding or maybe not breeding um, can really help uh, ultimately impact your overall reproductive uh, performance in your herd. Questions with that so far? I'm gonna dive in and switch gears a little bit to get us thinking about breeding soundness exams, uh, why they're important, why I encourage anyone to, to get them done prior to the breeding season. Um, when we think about breeding soundness exams, uh, this is gonna be a snapshot in time, uh, but it's a really good indicator of where your bulls are at. Um, and one little piece to that puzzle in terms of making sure reproductive performance is um, at its best. So I like to break it down into four components. Uh, there's a physical exam. They, they measure the uh, squirrel circumference within that physical exam component uh, and then analyze that semen for motility and morphology. And so um, I, I usually recommend four to six weeks prior to the breeding season, have this done um, because if you have issues with the bull or you identify any injuries or uh, anything, you, you still have time to find a bull before you need to turn out on June one or uh, whenever breeding season is, right? And so um, if we're scrambling, I'd, I'd much rather have time uh, than, than last minute. So those components uh, and the breeding soundness exam, this is kind of that sample sheet that um, your veterinarian will, will fill out um, and submit. And so really looking at that physical appearance and then looking at those semen characteristics is really how they break it down. Um, when I think about a breeding soundness exam, why should we do it? Um, we know that it can be a little costly depending on where you're located and, and what the vet charges, um, but it's been shown to, to have a return investment of six and a half to seven dollars. And so when we think about increasing that number of female that that bull is exposed to, we see that return for, for that test. Um, that can help us identify issues in terms of satisfactory potential breeders, or maybe they're unsatisfactory. Um, this really is an insurance policy. This is gonna help kind of let you sleep and, and know that your bull's ready to do his job for that breeding season. And so um, there are a number of different times that we can do a breeding soundness exam. Um, the, the one time I really encourage is right before breeding season, uh, to make sure that those bulls are, are good. 
Um, but I also like to think about um, if we've purchased pools, make sure that's done and that's done in uh, a timely fashion. Um, you know, if that's January, those pools are getting done. Um, a lot can happen before that next breeding season. So just make sure that that does get done. Um, there's op opportunities to look at uh, right after the breeding season. Uh, maybe if we have really poor preg rates um, and, and trying to identify uh, bulls with fertility issues, um, poor semen tests could also be an indicator of overuse. And so maybe that stocking rate wasn't right, um, but these are things that can help us identify that. Um, also, um, if we're thinking about winter time, and I'll, I'll show you a few more slides here um, of, of what can happen if we do have winter time insults like um, frostbite to the scrotum. Uh, we have a 61 day sperm production cycle, right? So spermatogenesis takes about 60 days. And so if we have an insult in winter or an insult during the breeding season, um, those insults aren't going to show up until 60 days. And so that timing is really going to be important uh, when, when we're identifying that one point in time with our breed soundness exam. So I'm just going to run through our physical exam. Um, eyes, ears, feet are all really important uh, to check. You know, bulls need, need to be able to see where they're going what they're doing, be able to identify females that, that are mounting and exhibiting estrus. Um, they need to be able to cover ground. And so making sure that we're keeping up on, on pink eye and identifying issues um, are all really important when you think about sight. Um, also looking at teeth and, and mouth. And if we have injuries, uh, broken jaws, um, we, we start to see decreases in, in condition in those bulls. Um, and, and so those can all play issues as well. Um, and those are all things that um, get identified when we actually pull those bulls in for bringing sound to uh, Body condition, like I mentioned, um, throughout the year is a really good time to, to monitor condition and, and making sure you know where your bulls are at um, and, and that healthy weight to make sure that they're maintaining and doing their job. Feet and legs, like I mentioned, these guys need to be able to mount multiple times. Uh, and so do they have any issues structurally? Um, do they have issues with foot rot? Are they, um, are they injured? Um, these are all things, you know, do you have stifle issues? Did they get hurt um, out in the bullpen? Um, these are all potential issues that could reduce their ability to cover, cover females. Um, also then, uh, really great benefit sometimes, maybe not great, um, but the opportunity to get bulls in the shoot and perform a BSD is you can identify some of these issues, especially with the sheath, uh, broken penis, those types of things. Um, I was working on uh, doing some BSCs for a vet back home and a guy was having issues having his females get settled um, first thing, get the bull in the, in the chute and working on that, that physical exam. I get down, I drop the chute and I was like, well, here's your issue. Um, broken penis. I'm not even going to waste your money, uh, trying to do a trick test and, you know, oh, maybe we have some issues, reproductive diseases. Nope. You, your bull can't function. Um, but sometimes you can't feel that or see that without getting those bulls in. And so, um, highly recommend just being visual um, and, and really identifying some of those issues if they, they do happen. And so uh, besides broken penises, we, we do, uh, during those breeding soundness exams, want those bulls to fully ejaculate uh, to make sure that they don't have issues, they don't have um, any uh, persistent finulums that attach to that gland penis that restricts them from fully extending. Um, you need those bulls to be able to, to cover those females. And so um, if they do have issues um, that they're, they're not going to want to cover those females um, or, or be able to. Um, and also uh, warts, uh, corkscrew penises, um, if they have any uh, fibropapillomas, um, all of that can also impact fertility. 
um, and basically result in infertility. And so uh, these are all great ways to identify those issues um, if you're not always seeing those bulls uh, fully extend um, during the breeding season. So testes, the, the scrotal circumference, right, is one of those physical exams. Uh, they, they measure it and, and they write that down. Um, the big thing with testes is what they're feeling is they're feeling that neck, they're feeling any differences in size, um, any inflammation, damage. Uh, they're gonna feel that epididymis and that whole testy is where you have semen production, right? And so if there's any damage at all to those testes or, um, or heat, um, you're, you're impacting that sperm production. And so wanting to make sure that they're, uh, they're the same size and then ultimately they're gonna measure it at the widest part. Um, and then they get categorized uh, into different categories depending on age and the size of those. Um, when they're going in, um, they're looking outside and in internally as part of that physical exam. And so um, your, your vet's gonna get in and gonna palpate, right? And so you'll see them get in there before they maybe use a probe um, and, and get that semen collected. But ultimately what they're uh, feeling in there are these accessory sex glands and um, feeling if there's any inflammation uh, to those seminal vesicles or that prostate, because um, that's where uh, you'll, you'll see some of those issues. Um, that prostate is going to be that landmark. Uh, vesiculitis is fairly common. Um, and so that's why we're, we're getting uh, that internal palpation done as well to make sure that there's no inflammation there. Uh, typically, um, what, what's used is an electro ejaculator. Um, and so this will uh, stimulate that bull and um, <clears throat> provide mild uh, stimulation over uh, a period of time uh, to get that bull to fully ejaculate um, and, and collect that sample. Um, if you have bulls that are going and you're collecting a lot of semen for, for freezing or other things, most of the time those bulls are going to get trained uh, to use an artificial vagina. Um, that way they, um, they aren't being stimulated constantly uh, from the ejaculator uh, because those bulls are getting uh, collected multiple times during the week, during the day, um, during the month. So a little different than this one time uh, with the electro ejector. Uh, when we think about the breakdown, so we finally collected that semen. Now they're gonna place it on a slide, look in the microscope. And so what, what they are, are gonna look at is motility and morphology. Morphology needs a minimum of 70% normal sperm heads. Um, so we can't have double heads, we can't have broken heads. Um, but we can, but we at least have to have 70% normal uh, to pass. Um, motility targets 30% um, and basically is fair. Um, now we, we would like bulls to, to be higher, right? In terms of motility, we want to make sure that that sperm is actively traveling, right? And, and is gonna uh, be the, the quickest one to, to fertilize that egg. And so, <clears throat> We, we like to see motility higher, um, but 30% is that cutoff. They've got to at least pass that. Um, here's the table that I was talking about in terms of scrotal circumference. Um, based on age here on the top of the table uh, for this first table, um, the bulls need to hit this minimum scrotal circumference depending on their age and months. So if they don't meet that, that's a ding on their test. Uh, that says, yep, you're, you're uh, underperforming, uh, you're, you're not meeting that minimum requirement. Uh, <clears throat> what are other ways that we might see our bulls fail in terms of uh, a BSE? Uh, this, again, was out of that same data set um, in North Dakota. They compared yearly and mature bulls. And what they're identifying as some of the, uh, the, the largest percentage of, of bulls uh, failing uh, really is due to morphology. And so in terms of what that, those sperm look like, if there's broken heads, multiple tails, um, deformities there, 
Um, you'll, that's where we're first gonna see it, um, especially in our mature bulls, um, broken penis and issues with the penis are uh, you know, second highest here in terms of reasons that they won't pass that test. Um, and then motility issues as well is pretty similar among our yearly and our mature bulls. Um, and then scrotal size, feet and legs are a few others, but uh, those are kind of our, our three big uh, players in terms of, of why our bulls might fail. Um, <clears throat> when we are selecting females, especially if we're um, using bulls and, and selecting uh, for for bull um, <clears throat> pelvic size and, and weight. Um, we, we've seen that parability in terms of pelvic area in our bulls really correlates to daughter. So if we're thinking about calving ease um, and that pelvic size, if we're measuring those females, um, increased pelvic size in that sire ultimately uh, would increase pelvic size in his daughter. Thus, um, we're seeing increased calving ease. Um, so that is another measurement that can be done if we're working with yearling bulls um, or even mature bulls, um, getting that pelvic measured and kind of having an idea um, if that's an indicator that you'd like to, to utilize. Uh, trick testing is another one that most of the time when you're uh, going to the vet, recommend it, especially if there's areas where uh, maybe you have high inc instances of this, um, but it, it is a venereal disease. So that basically is transmitted from cow to cow. So if that bull has it um, in that prepuce um, is where then he's going to, to shed uh, depending on how many females he's breeding, um, which then can spread like wildfire, um, which ultimately then you start seeing abortions and early calf loss. Um, and so that's, that's one that generally, um, you know, talk to your vet and um, have those conversations um, but that, that vet will take a sample and send it off um, and then um, will let you know where, where those bulls are at. Um, other things to, to think about when we're, we've got that bull in the chute, um, identifying any other issues, uh, lameness, pink eye, uh, talked about vesiculitis, um, all of that really can influence that bull's ability to cover females. Um, making sure then we're also getting those bulls on a similar schedule uh, for pre-breeding shots, um, talking with your vet to, to make sure that um, those bulls are, are getting uh, vaccinated against infectious reproductive diseases um, is all, also something to consider, um, just maintaining that overall uh, bull health. So recapping in terms of, of what we wanna be thinking about on how we're managing those bulls, thinking about breeding soundness exams, we want to make sure that they're satisfactory breeders. So do they meet the minimum requirements? Do they get the, the good, clean seal of health from the vet? They're ready to go. If we're utilizing younger bulls, make sure we are adjusting that, that stocking rate to accommodate them trying to figure it out. Uh, our two and three plus year old bulls, um, that experience is going to lend well in terms of just covering uh, X number of females and then meeting that, that ratio. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, encourage you to watch your groups, watch your bulls. Um, and if you are seeing any libido issues, injuries, those types of things, um, hopefully identify those sooner rather than later um, when we're impacting some of our pregnancy rates. So uh, these last few slides, I'm gonna get us thinking about just winter management and really just highlighting some of the points we covered earlier, um, really thinking about how cold weather can impact fertility. And so that importance of getting a breeding soundness exam um, done, especially after winter, uh, can be highly valuable, um, especially if we have frostbite issues um, where you'll start to see scabbing or sloughing of uh, that tissue on the lower portion of the scrotum. Um, that frostbite, you know, can impact fertility. And I'll show you some, some data here on the next slide. Um, but we've got 60 days for that bull to recover. And so if we have insults or injuries, do we give them enough time to get tested to make sure that we, we don't have any um, serious issues with fertility? 
So this is a summary really looking at the effect of severity of frostbite um, and, and what we see, especially with a severe frostbite injury, um, we see a very large proportion of bulls being unsatisfactory breeders uh, during their breeding soundness exam. So about 88% in this study um, found that bulls, if we have severe insults, um, aren't passing those exams. Now, um, sometimes we think, well, that was you know, 60 days ago or 100 days ago. Um, we need to be able to give them time to recover if we do have some serious insults like that. Now, mild frostbite um, is kind of the opposite. 89% uh, satisfactory. So depending on that severity, um, we can have some pretty big impacts in terms of those bulls passing their, um, their soundness exam. Uh, I like to, to illustrate from World Bank and Parish in, in the late 80s, um, you know, they need 70% morphology, right? That's the, the minimum. Um, now, they basically had random groups that passed and or selected for 80% or greater normal sperm. So they were basically trying to, to get the cream of the crop here. Um, they still were seeing uh, five to 6% increases over this two year study in terms of pregnancy rate. So understanding where your bulls are at in terms of their morphology, motility, um, we, we are seeing some benefits for selecting those bulls uh, with, with greater semen characteristics, um, ultimately helping increase those overall pregnancy rates. Now, uh, my, my percentages on the top got cut off here, um, but what I really like to highlight is if you're purchasing bulls, make sure they have a BSC done um, and or you get one done when they get to your ranch, um, just to make sure that you know what you're working with prior to the breeding season. Now, if you had a bull purchased maybe a couple of years ago um, and you haven't done a BSC on him, I would also encourage you to consider before the next breeding season, knowing where he's at. Um, we have a very low proportion of, of operators that will get that done, especially um, if they've already uh, purchased bulls um, and it's been a year or two, um, but a lot can happen between this breeding season and the next winter, et cetera. And so I um, really encourage you to, to think about that investment um, for your bulls. Um, so when we're thinking about getting ready, um, consider doing that breeding soundness exam. Um, you know, those benefits and that return uh, can really help you identify those bulls that you might be having issues with. Um, really think about what, what their um, vaccination protocols need to be. Um, you know, what they originally uh, may have thought as, as yearlings um, and, and talking with your vet to make sure that they get on uh, your similar cow protocol as well. Um, control for lice and flies, check those feet and legs, um, establish that social dominance before you start turning bulls out for the breeding season um, are all uh, something I really like uh, producers to consider. Um, when we're thinking about cold weather, you know, uh, it's been pretty mild. Um, but having windbreaks and having opportunities for those bulls to, to not have insults like uh, frostbite to those scrotums uh, can really be encouraged and prevented. Um, so if there are opportunities to get them um, off the cold frozen ground um, and, and making sure that they're maintaining that body heat um, and, and maintaining that energy are all things that we can consider um, and, and don't forget about. You know, sometimes I think we, we get ready for calving season and, and colder weather with our, our cow herd, um, but sometimes we, we may forget that our bulls are out um, as well and may need to, to be addressed to, to help make sure we don't have any insults. So bottom line, um, if you have questions about where your bulls are at in terms of condition um, or, or how we're managing them, um, reach out to your extension educator, reach out to me. I have cards um, here. If you ever have questions on where your bulls are at or where they need to be. Um, you know, one thing I really like to have you guys think about is uh, if we have younger bulls that need to put some weight on, or maybe we have some thinner, older bulls, um, you know, what is that opportunity to, to separate those bulls and target feed them uh, to make sure that we're meeting those requirements 
uh, for those gains. Um, you know, making sure that we give them plenty of space, establish that dominance early um, are all, all something we need to consider. Um, and, and figuring out what that right timing is and that opportunity to get those goals uh, tested uh, to help you make any decisions uh, before the breeding season are all something I hope that you can take away today uh, and get you guys thinking about um, those goals out in the pasture. So with that, I will turn it back over to Brandy. Uh, and if you have any questions, um, I can open the floor for a couple questions uh, right here in the front. So the question was the libido test. Um, so libido is not tested when we think about a breeding sound or thing. Now, um, back in the day, uh, to, to test libido, uh, they would have a, a female in estrus and would track the number of mouths that that bull uh, would perform in um, a very short period of time. So give them about a minute or so and, and see what what his activity looked like. Um, now that doesn't get tested and not very many people do that. Um, but what I would encourage you if you're thinking about libido and where your bulls are at, um, if there's an opportunity to uh, potentially synchronize a couple females or you know some females are in estrus, um, throwing that bull in and, and really making sure that he's identifying those females, he's getting that job done, uh, can really help you understand what that libido is. Now, um, when we think about bulls and multi-sire pastures, um, that competition can also then start increasing um, a little bit of that libido or drive to, to get females pregnant. And so we can see multiple sires covering multiple females, um, especially if they're coming into estrus or in estrus. Um, and so they're ready to breed. Um, and so libido is not measured, it's very just observed. Um, and so there's opportunities where, where you can identify that um, and then target some of those groups uh, to make sure that those goals actually figured out. So does that help? Yeah, so, so you miss you, if it's one bull in a pasture, you're, you're expecting that he's going to get the job done, and uh, he did. So, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, if, if there's opportunities to go out and observe uh, during the breeding season, you know, I uh, research studies and you're, you're doing things, you, you turn up uh, the old station and you kind of just sit and pasture watch, uh, but it, it can tell you a lot in making sure that are, are they covered females or uh, maybe he's more interested in somebody uh, in the other pasture um, or maybe he's more interested in just eating grass and not doing his job, right? Um, and so uh, just going out and observing that um, or else yes, then you can have cases. Um, and, and it does happen, unfortunately, more often than not. Uh, so great, great question. Right. Question. So the, the question was, um, we're, we're doing a yearly study out of US Mark, uh, year one data. Uh, we, we looked at bulls covering females uh, versus not. So they got basically an extra month. Um, we don't have enough data, but we were seeing when you're looking at observations that those yearly bulls that weren't breeding, um, they increased semen uh, morphology and motility um, just by kind of having that extra month of not working. Um, so really interested to see you don't have stats on it, just more anecdotal at this point, um, but it would be interesting to, to see uh, what those goals look like uh, here in the next couple of years. Um, and also we have an opportunity to put them on uh, heifers and as well um, and put them out on some more mature cows. So um, be able to see some differences in preg rate uh, potentially, but uh, we've got a couple more here for this. Yes, sir. Uh, I think it would be good for you to take a look at the activity of the big large sheep, what time you're trying to make them. 
Excellent. So, uh, question was if our, our bulls get turned out June uh, for breeding, uh, calving in March, correct? Uh, so, when would be a good time to, to pull those bulls in, making sure that we're, we're potentially increasing uh, body condition on those? Um, so, I, I'd go look after today. Um, go, go take a look at your pasture and look at your bulls. See where they're at in terms of condition. Um, now is a great time. You have time between calving and, and turnout um, if you do need to address any issues. Um, so what I would think about um, if you're a June turnout, uh, first of March, considering getting those bulls in for a breeding soundness exam sometime March, April, um, and depending on kind of timeline, that'll give you enough time if you do have any issues um, that you can make some changes before the breeding season. So in terms of uh, change in semen quality, so if we're talking about insults or, or management changes, um, your, your question is then how long or when would we see differences, right? Um, so if something happened today, we aren't gonna see what happens for another 60 days in terms of any differences in seeming characteristic changes. Um, so when we're thinking about um, really fat bulls that, that may be losing some condition or, or maybe we're trying to increase condition, um, we, we will start to see improvements or changes potentially um, in semen. Um, but it would have to be a, a very severe insult uh, to see big change. So uh, if we're if we're just trying to add another hundred pounds, um, we might not see a big difference in semen uh, changes. Um, but if workload or something a really big insult is happening, then we may see some bigger differences down the road in, in about six weeks. Does that kind of help give you the timeline? Uh, the pelvic area? Yeah. Okay. So in terms of heritability for pelvic size, um, there's a strong correlation for heritability of a bull um, pelvic area and, and female pelvic area, which ultimately would increase calving heat. Um, so if you have the data that there's generally a strong correlation that the, the larger the, the pelvic area, you'll also see that in the females. Um, now that could be something that you measure. Not everyone measures pelvic area in heifers, um, but if you're really targeting cavity ease and, as a production trait that you're looking at, um, that is uh, something that you can have done and measured uh, your vet can definitely get in and measure that for you and give you that information. So, uh, in terms of increasing pelvic area or increasing. So, it's, it's uh, usually about 50 50. So, what you're going to have from the bull, what you're having from that cow is all going to play. Into, into that. But there is a strong correlation. If you select bulls with a larger pelvic area, you're generally going to see an increase in terms of academies just with those females for that age. But that's not the only thing, right? There's a lot of other things at play, um, but it is one, one trait that you can look at. If that's a, of interest or maybe a, an issue that you're trying to overcome. There's an all, a whole other thing we could talk about in terms of heifer selection and, and traits and those types of things that we could really dive into um, to, to help you identify some of those issues. But um, one, one simple thing, if you have that bull in the sheep, there are opportunities to kind of see where they fall. Yeah, one more question, and then I, I'm sure we've got another speaker here. I don't want to take up all our time. So.
So, so the question is, um, in, in terms of uh, potential management, uh, could we put in some open cows uh, before the breeding season to get those bulls ready? Um, I, I would uh, recommend uh, either synchronizing those couple female, if you do have some cool cows that you'd like to, um, to get in before your herd, um, that would be a great way to, to check libido like we were talking about earlier, um, but also encouraging synchronization so you know that those females are actually coming into heat. Um, the, the one thing I would worry if we're using just throwing females in and we don't know when they're going to be cycling is knowing when we should be identifying uh, those mounts and act, that activity um, in terms of onset of estrus. So um, I'd encourage if you had a cedar or even, uh, even a shot of uh, prostaglandin uh, would help jump start that cycle, um, which would then help you identify if those bulls are um, identifying those females coming into heat. So I think a, a great way if you do have some extra cows, you can set them aside um, and, and basically that libido test, but would encourage um, just a, even a, a PG shot to, to get them started. Great question. Anyone else? Check. Question. Oh, we got another one here. Yep. Yeah, the scrotal cycle, does that change after two years? Or is that pretty much stay solid after the week two? So uh, the question was, does scrotal size increase after two years of age? Um, so scrotal size it can, can change uh, anytime, um, especially when we think about um, that cover. So if we uh, start to get our roly-poly bowls, uh, we start to see fat accumulating around the scrotum, uh, which ultimately, if you remember some of those early slides um, with the imaging and uh, thinking about heat, um, that can ultimately impact uh, that that sperm that that's sitting there in the uh, in the testes, and so we don't want that to happen in terms of fat. Now. As bulls mature, you will see that increase um, in scrotal size, um, but in terms of, of how you're measuring it, you don't see uh, drastic changes um, with age, um, but fat um, can accumulate and be one indicator um, that I'd be, be aware of, especially if you have large accumulations uh, over time. 